Welcome to Planet 412. I'm your host, Matt Emsch. This is the land of the weird, the strange, the paranormal, cryptids creeping around. We have a very special guest today from across the pond. Paul Sinclair is joining us today. He really does not need any introduction. The man, you know, is well known from coast to coast, the four corners of the world. And I just wanted to welcome Paul. Thank you for being here tonight, sir. Do you know, it's a pleasure, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm not sure anybody's going to top the Youngstown Dogman story, but we shall, we shall have a go to the, tonight at sharing a few of my own encounters with the weird and the strange. Oh, so well, thank you. Absolutely. It's, it's an honor for me to have you on. Uh, you know, for anyone that doesn't know, we did a Thanksgiving Day interview that that was really, you know, just phenomenal. I got to know you and, and Les very well, and I, I'm proud to call you guys friends. And this is a great opportunity. I, I greatly appreciate it. You know, you have written, I believe, five books. Uh, could you go over them for us, please? Yeah, I never thought I would write a book at all, Matt. You know, worked with my hands all my life as a joiner, knocking nails in wood. Uh, didn't retire as such because I'm 61 now, so it's still not retirement age, but I packed in that kind of work, 48. Uh, not made loads of money. I'm not going to great detail about it, but we enough to survive. <clears throat> so I, I, I d devote the full time to the research of the unexplained. Wrote the first book. I don't have a copy of it here, but Truth Proof, number one. Then we did two, three, and number four, we had a break from it, and I wrote The Night People, which is about my own experiences through childhood. And then I wrote Truth, the, the next Truth Proof volume, although there were a break, there's five books. And all about the strange and the unusual, and it's the full spectrum of unexplained phenomena, Matt. And I suppose, like yourself, if you've had experiences from childhood, and throughout your life, that interest is there. You, do, you don't have to start scratching your head and thinking, well, now, do I believe in this? Do I believe in that? Because it's not a belief thing. When you've had the experience, you know. You don't need to believe in it because you actually know you've been there. You know, I, I can't claim to have had this terrifying cryptid experience, but I've seen things from childhood. I would say, as we know, a child doesn't keep a diary. But from the age of... 1962, I was born, and I think that from the age of about 66, 1966, should I say, I saw things in a perfectly mediocre council house, three-bedroom, semi-detached house in the UK that defied explanation. These beings should not have been entering my bedroom in the darkness, the hours of darkness, uh, and absolutely terrifying a child and that's all that it was i've gotten i know people talk about love and light and the, the 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 brilliant things that our these visitors are supposed to be doing for mankind and doing for humans my experience was sheer terror and it, and it it stopped at about the age of 14 matt uh and then it picked up again when i when we moved to east yorkshire me and my wife and our family it literally started, it's almost like your life's planned because it started within w days, even of weeks of moving into that property. It began again and petered out in 1998. But it, all of this has put me on the path that I'm on today, the similar path what you're on today and other people watching your channel, looking for answers. That's all we're all doing, feeling around in the dark. And, you know, I, I, I feel for you, you know, obviously going through what I went through with my three friends when I was 14, it was not, a, 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 like you had said, a, a light, happy, you know, great experience. You know, my, my eye-opening event to the world being much bigger and, and, you know, knowing that things go bump in the night was not positive at all. Um, I have had a couple events as well uh, that, that were put more on the positive side, uh, but I, I'm sorry that you had gone through that. Um, you know, what an honor. Congratulations on writing the five books. Could you, before we get into more of the meat, uh, so to speak, of it, about maybe, you know, just give our, our listeners a little idea of, of what it takes to, to write a book? Well, yeah, and, and I, I don't even know if your listeners are asking the right person. I, I was absolutely useless at school. <laughs> I just no, no, I forged a living, made a good exist, a, a good life for myself, my wife, and our four girls. No, no problem there. So it makes you wonder when you go to school, 
if everything you're taught in school, half of it's probably no use to you. Yeah. Uh, so my spelling and my grammar, very poor. The books have all been edited, but it's all come out of my head. What does it take to write the books? I, the, all these books are collections of first-hand accounts. Somebody comes to me, tells me they've had an experience. First of all, I want to speak to them. I don't just want an email and then me uh, with 500 words and me bolster that up into two and a half thousand words for a book. Mm -hmm. It's just fodder. I want to meet the people face to face. As you know, we've done the documentary Wolflands. And, and so it's part of the book, which some of the accounts in Wolflands are in the phenomenal, book. Phenomenal, phenomenal. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. But what I'm what we did, Les included, some of those witnesses we actually met at ground zero, should we say, and went into the forest and spent nights in the forest, not just filming them, but getting to know these people, getting to know the, the sincerity of who and what they were about. They'd had their experiences. And and I could see, um, well, I'll be honest with you, 100% straight up that Steve, I know you asked about the books, but I'll just go here for a moment. Steve, who was in Broxa Forest when this creature appeared and watched them all night, contacted me after your interview. And he's, he, how much he felt for you and how much he said it made him feel better, not because you'd suffered mentally and emotionally after seeing it, but, but he has. And it just made him feel better knowing other people were out there, you know, because... When he first started talking about this, he'd shared it with no one apart from Jimmy, who was with him on the night. And and, and if you want, I'll run through this account. Of course, please. So there's three witnesses. We'll call witness number three never went on camera. He he didn't want to. And that's fine. But Steve contacted me, doing what everyone does, myself included, whilst looking for answers in books on the internet, speaking to people, and he contacted me to say that. <clears throat> him and two friends had seen something that looked like it had stepped from a horror movie in a forest called Broxa Forest in North Yorkshire, which would be about 25 miles away from where I'm sat now. It's the North, it's the North Yorkshire Moors National Park. So there's forest, moorland, farms interspersed in between. There's 525 square miles of not totally barren land, but very, very desolate area. Jimmy who's his friend who's in the film in Wolflands, he's the guy that finds the locations. They're not interested in the unexplained at all. They go, they take the fishing tackle, they'll take a few beers, food, and it's just three guys and they're on a weekend adventure because they work mm -hmm. hard all week. They, they, Jimmy picks, looks on Google Earth and finds this very, very remote place on, uh, on the edge of Broxa Forest. Incidentally, Matt, even the name's fabulous because the Broxa in folklore is a shape-shifting demon. Mm. Uh, yet we've got, they're in a forest called Broxa, which I find fascinating. So they arrive late. They've travelled from a place called Rotherham, which is approximately 120 to 130 miles away. And they arrive on the forest, in, uh, on the edge of the forest quite late, park their vehicle. Don't know what they're, gonna, what they're in for. They've only seen it on a map. And we, they know that the River Derwent runs in the bottom of this ravine. The ravine is 700 foot deep. And when I say seven, I don't mean it's seven and it's actually only three. It's 700 foot deep, very steep, but they don't need ropes. But in places, they're going down on the bottoms, on the backsides. Mm -hmm. Full of pines, all mature pine trees and spruce trees. It's really, it doesn't look unlike the forests in America. It's really, it's a remote place and, a, and a, a, an old bit of woodland because the logging companies cannot get in because of the steepness of the ravine. Mm -hmm. Interesting. This it becomes interesting because witness number three, when they get down into the ravine, Steve and Jimmy say, it's just starting to get dark, but we, the, it's quite seasoned. They set the, the tarps up and everything else and the hammocks and get a fire going. But witness number three says, I don't like it. We've got to go. We're being watched. So they're looking at each other and thinking, what's the matter with him? He never, ever talks like this. Mm. You see, they would come for a, a weekend kind of jolly. You know, that's, they're not there for the unexplained. So we, we can't leave now. It'll be, it's just took us ages to get down into this ravine. And in some places on us backsides, we're not going to get back up in the dark. We're staying. We've got to go. We're being watched. Something's watching us. So this continues. It's darkness has fallen. They sat around the fire. 
they're quite agitated because or or un uneasy for their friend because he's he's acting out of character I don't know, amount of time passes, and I think it's just before midnight. I think if they said about quarter, quarter to 12, quarter past 12, they haven't got, they haven't looked at the watch. They think that's what it is. And witness number three says, look, look. And in the distance, and I took a surveyor's tape in weeks later in the daylight with a friend, because we know where they were camped. There's, there's still the fire rem remnants there, and we know where it showed up. It was actually 42 feet away from them. Oh in the gosh. distance... Yeah, in the distance, a huge pair of amber eyes lit up. Self-illuminating eyes. Does any comparisons here, Matt? You know? Yeah, the hairs just stood up on my neck. And he, Jimmy, and if anybody watches Wolfland, I'm sorry for plugging the this these are the DVDs, but it is available on Amazon Prime. Jimmy said, I looked at these eyes, they were about three foot off the ground, and I didn't I couldn't think of an animal to assign these eyes to. And he's holding his fist out, Matt, like that. And he's saying they're that far apart. He said, and they're human shaped, but they're huge. And they're amber. And they're glowing. There's no light on them. Mm -hmm. Witness number three is terrified. He's absolutely beside himself. And they're holding him because they think he's going to run off into the darkness. This continued... For up to 30 minutes. So, you know, they're not keeping a time on how long it continued, but they assumed about 30 minutes. And eventually, Jim said, I could stand no more of this. I stood up, took a few paces towards these eyes, making some hissing and shooing sounds, and they disappeared. He said, I thought, thank God for that. You know, that's 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 good. He said, the next thing, he says, I turn round to see Steve and witness number three. And their jaws have dropped. They look absolutely horrified. And I, I'm saying some of this in their words because we spent that many years, was three years we spent making Wolflands. I can hear Jimmy saying it. He says, and I turned round. He says, and I just thought, oh, my God. From those eyes being three foot off the ground, they're now seven foot in the mm. air. Mm. He says, yeah, he's, he said, I just didn't know what we were looking at. We're hanging on to our friend. They actually believe, Matt, that if they had not been able to hold on to him and that partly occupied them, they probably would have run off into the darkness. That was a kind of distraction. There was not a full moon, but there was enough backlight to light this thing up. And Steve said you couldn't have fitted like two or three men inside the bulk of this thing. Mm -hmm. He said we could see deltoids, huge traps, the arms, they didn't see the legs because it's, it's, there's undergrowth there. And, and th then he said it went up to this head, and we'll get to its face in a moment, that they didn't see teeth because see these self-illuminating eyes. Steve said, if you'd have asked me to draw a werewolf, I would not have drawn that. He said, it was, he said its ears looked ridiculous. He said they were far too big, stuck upright, with tufts of fur on the ends of them. Mm -hmm. And I went... I'll jump to the description in a moment, but I, when I went back with the surveyor's tape, we'd got a rough idea of its height. It was 87 inches to its to to where they estimated its eyes were on the no. tree. So then we've got the forehead and the ears. So he said, well, "Let me." I've just lost my own thread there by doing that. Uh, yeah, he said we thought it was growling at us, even from that distance. We could hear it. Then after a while. Because all it did was stand. He said it was almost like in an American footballer's stance, as though it were just going to blast forward. Mm. And, and he said, after, after a while, we realised it was its breathing. It was so powerful and guttural. It was actually its breathing. And then every so often, they said it turned to the right. And when it turned to the right, they saw its muzzle. And this is another reason why Steve said, if you would have asked me to draw, draw a werewolf or a dogman and... It's strange because Jimmy used the used the word dog man. I, we said, well, what did you see? And Jimmy said, we saw a dog man. And Steve said, we saw a werewolf. But he said his muzzle, it, it was ridiculously long. It, it just looked far too long for what we'd, I expected if I'd have ever seen anything like this. And so basically there's there's a little bit of a time anomaly as well that the, none of them seem to know what happened because they know it, it watched them all night 
even though Jimmy has no recollection of what happened through the night after the first hour or so, that could just be the fear that's overtaken them. Steve said, in the end, I dare not even look at this thing. I dare not even look. He says, even in my peripheral, I could see the glow. No. He said, but I dare not look at it because I, I wanted it to be over. And he literally meant he wanted to die. He wanted it. He said, just to, to finish with this fear that's been put upon me. Daytime comes and it's gone. Witness number three, who has gone through this night of absolute terror, and, I, and we think it, well, he's perceived it before. And I need to draw back a bit as in a moment, and I will do, because there's something else. When they pack their gear up hastily, witness number three is saying, and they call, we've got Jimmy and we've got Steve. I'll not say his surname, but he said his surname, but I'll say Steve. He, he said, uh, it's not gone yet to Jimmy. It's still here. It's still watching us. And then he said, and he said, and his surname, he says, and you, Steve. So we'll, because I don't want to say the guy's surname. It's and you, Steve. He says, it's still here. He said, and as we were walking out, he's saying, it's still here. It's still watching us. He said, Jim said, and then we got a certain distance. He said, we're all right now. It's gone now. <laughs> so this guy, somehow it was interacting with this, this witness number three. And another reason why, and I said, I would draw back and, just catch myself because I've missed a seg section out during the process of these guys watching this monster, because essentially that's what they were watching. Uh, he turns to Jim and he goes, it don't want, this is broad Yorkshire, Matt, you know, how, how they would talk. It means it doesn't want you. He said, it don't want the ear, uh, Jimmy. It don't want the ear. It wants the to go, meaning you, it wants you to go. And, and then he looked at Steve and he said his surname, but he said, and you, Steve, it doesn't want you here. It doesn't want the ear. It wants you to go. So from that, I'm taking on board that this thing was somehow communicating with witness number three. Mm -hmm. They'd not picked up on it until we started talking. Like I said, Les has been in forest with us. Uh, we've been in on many occasions, to be honest with you, with other witnesses as well, who've seen things of a similar nature and, and, and uncannily, Matt, in and around the same forests. It's uh, whatever this thing is. I don't believe it's resident to the forest, you know, as in, is it real when it's here? I do think there's some reality to it. And I do think that yeah, yeah, it potentially could really do some serious harm to somebody, even fatally. Yes. But, but I think it's from some other kind of realm. It's from some other sphere of existence. Uh, you know, uh, in your side of the world, uh, I'm not, and I think, and I think we're on the same page with it anyway, Matt, but your side of the world, I see the potential for some researchers to think that things have evaded detection and the huge forests where they could hide and reside, but not in the UK. We don't have the, the sort of luxury of, monstrous forests and vast mm -hmm. expanses of mountains and you know so i don't it's not here it's a creature that's just coming from some other realm without a doubt so that's the brox the werewolf story <laughs> that, that's you know I, I can't tell you know if you don't know if you've noticed i keep wiping on my face i've started sweating a few times because i've first of all obviously i've heard a lot of similarities to what i saw and my three friends um i, I have been very you know, uh, forthright and, and, and very out about my belief of what we saw was not natural, that, you know, I am a firm believer that there is a, a veil that is in front of all of us. And some of these creatures are able to, to, to like the priest I sought help from, bleed in between our worlds. They come from elsewhere. And, you know, I, I do know quite a bit of you know things that have gone on and, and you're i always say neck of the woods it, it, it's so supernaturally charged over there and and you have so many open flat lands and yeah there not many places like you think of like in, in oregon and and in the northwest of, of all of those forests where like sasquatch or sabe can hide and yeah, no, these things are able to to cross, you know, those doors that we can't see. And I, I believe it. And that sure sounds quite a bit like what I had seen, you know, when you said the size of, you know, about three men with wise, that's basically the size of the thing that I had seen. Absolutely. And, and I mean, I'll go into another account for you in a moment, but 
I, I think rational people, rational thinking people can't fail to not believe that these things are from somewhere else. It's the attributes that they possess, as in the self-illuminating eyes. We've got bioluminescence in marine life, but we've mm -hmm. not got that in the animal kingdom. And, and it's the movement, Matt. And that's if we jump to the, the Bigfoot scenario, I, I think Les will agree. And I think our witness will agree. We're not sure what, although we call it Wolflands, uh, we, 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 it's primarily it's the cryptids. And we've got a, a gamekeeper in a forest literally seven miles away from where these guys had their encounter. They had their encounter in 2018. And I think it were August. Les might correct me, but I think it was August 2018. Seven miles away inland, there's a there's an area called not Brox, called Stape, and it, ancient. And there's a lot of burial mounds and ancient earthworks around these places as well. And there's a gamekeeper working in Stape in the forests of Stape and Cropton around 2002, and he's found an abandoned farmhouse within the forest. And when I say found, Matt, literally found because he'd been working there a few years. And he went off track one day and just entered into a clearing and there's a farmhouse. It's doors swinging wide in the wind. It's a, he found out it had been empty since 1956. Wow. And, yeah, there were table in it. There's a, there were a well for water. And we, we actually looked at the farmhouse, you know, all, all legally, if, you, if that makes sense. We looked at the farmhouse. Everything were broken down, the fences and everything. And this guy gave us his account of what, he saw back in uh, 2002. The first thing was light form phenomena. His cousin had come to stay with him for a few days. And whilst walking up a logging road during the night, uh, about two or three meters away, not even that, a huge sphere of, uh, not a huge sphere, baseball sized sphere of white light shot up into the heavens. He thought it, they'd come upon a tripwire flare because it's quite close to area Filingdale's, a military base. And he thought there were some squaddies out in forest. He said, and he grabbed his cousin and dropped him to the floor. He said, and we just waited and nothing happened. He looked for scorch marks, nothing. The next day he looked for scorch marks, you know, magnesium burns on, from the trip mm -hmm. rifle, nothing. From that moment, and his cousin went home the next day, not because of that, he just went home. From that moment, himself and another gamekeeper started hearing a baby crying in the forest on occasion they'd go to where they perceived this crying came from it had stopped and it had been further in the forest then he said that when he was cutting wood around the farmhouse or doing some chores getting a bit of water he felt like there was something on his shoulder as in right next to him he said and he turned around sharply there's nothing there and he could hear whispering you know, like just on the peripheral, just kind of whispering. Mm. So that was the build up after the a sphere of light. So the farmhouse, he, he described it as having a door at the back that was barricaded, a door at the front that had a bolt on it and a little fire in a small living room. And he lit the fire this particular night, got into his sleeping bag after having some food, sleeping on the floor, this guy, feet to the fire. Early hours of the morning, he wakes up. He admits he doesn't know why he woke up, but he did. And he's found himself looking at the window. We're in the middle of, he's got a clearing about 40 foot in front are pine trees and either side was pine trees back in the day. It's been clear felled now. Back in the day, that's what it was like. So he's in like this oblong clearing. But there's no properties around for miles and miles. There's nothing but forest. And he just laid there looking at the window and very slowly, this huge figure came to the window, taller than the window. So it's looking down. He said, and from where I am, the embers of the fire were just glowing. He, he thought he was in the shadow. Didn't see no glowing eyes, saw no teeth, he just uh, no ears. He just saw this monstrous head that was, it, if there were ears, they were higher than the window anyway. He saw this monstrous head on even bigger shoulders. And I said to him, I said, do you think it could have got through the door easily? He said it was so big, it could have come through the wall if it had wanted. That's how big it was. He said it was just monstrous. So he had an uncomfortable night. I mean, anybody watching Wolflands will realise when they listen to this man talk, he's a real imposing guy. 
and a real genuine kind of guy as well. Really, he's articulate and speaks about his experience kind of with, with accuracy. I think he never wavered his story over years. Really good. He said so the next day. Or a few days later, because the, the baby crying in the forest, strange things were still happening. He decided he was going to get the, what he called the drop on it. And I don't mean he was going to attack it or, have, or anything. No, he's not got that in his mind. He said, but after this un, unnerving experience with it looking in the window, he said it stayed there for about five to ten minutes and then just left. He said, I went to the edge of these trees, which would have been, I don't know, 30 to 40 feet away. He says, and the pines are coming down. He says, and I set a tarp up on the on the ground underneath the boughs of the branches, and I laid there with warm, dry clothing on, and I just laid there all night, he said, and in the early hours of the morning, it came out. He says, and it came out of the forest from left to right. The, here's where it gets weird. Here's, where, here's why these things aren't... Here's why you're on the same page as me. These things are more than flesh and blood. He said, and it walked down the farm building. He says, and its head was just above the gutter. And we don't mean the second floor, but the first floor. There's like the house, and then it drops down to barns. Mm -hmm. And its head just above the gutter. So we know it was well over seven foot tall. And it goes along, he says, but it didn't walk. He said, I never saw its legs move. It just arrived. He said, it was like taking a torch beam down the building. And this thing just was so fluid and smooth. He said, and it went to the window. And it looked in. He says, but do you know, I think it knew exactly where I were. He, he said, either that or there was another one watching me. And he, he, he worded it really well, Matt, uh, you know, straight off the cuff. And he said, so I'm laid there watching it, watching me, because he'd put a sleeping bag inside, packed with all his gear in it, as though it was mm -hmm. him. He said, so I'm laid there watching it, watching me, while I think another one's watching me. Oh, from slightly. the behind. Yeah, he, so then he said, after a while, we we'll said five or ten minutes, because I really don't know, it turned and literally the word glide, just glided back to the forest and had gone. He said the most ner unnerving part for him was going back into the farmhouse because he didn't know whether it had gone around the back and was somehow inside or anything. Mm -hmm. Spent that night in the farmhouse. A few days later, he left the job and he'd never come back. Uh, and... He's, he's intrigued. This guy's got the mindset of uh, he, he wants to know what it is. Just like Jimmy and Steve, uh, uh, you know, the guys in Broxer, he wants to know what it is exactly that interacted. Whether we ever will or not, I don't know. I noted when you spoke uh, on the Truth Proof channel that you, I, you'd had this strange dream uh, and, 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 a, and a message in the dream. Yes. And I, I would, obviously, I wouldn't want to alter your mindset but it's 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 a it's a terrifying thing to have such a dream Matt, after seeing something like that potentially thinking will i see this again one day you know yes absolutely so th there's two accounts from wolflands and you know uh when we when we got out of the forest that morning from broxer myself les uh, a guy called chris wright came with us uh, he, he's been integral part of making the film all the way through he's been in with on all the all the little expeditions into the forest and he knows the area better than we do anyway but steve literally broke down crying his arm he was he says like i feel like i've conquered something you know he says I, I, before coming in he says weeks before i thought am i going to do this shall i do this shall i shall i do it he says days before i'm thinking the anxiety then the night before i'm thinking i'm, I'm going to back out i can't do it he said, but I've done it. And, you know, we, we I, I'm not sure if Les came in with me on this occasion. Uh, when, when we see Les, when he comes on screen, I'll ask him. Um, but I went in again with a friend of mine who was a police officer. And uh, he, he's kept all this. He doesn't mix his interest in the unexplained with, with his job or his friends within the job. So I don't use his name, but I took he, he came in. Uh, we made sure that Jimmy and Steve knew he was a police officer. Nobody's getting tricked. But I had said to this guy, I said, will you interview them? Not grill them, but interview them as though you, you, you kind of, when you get them to tell you the story and see whether you can get pull any inconsistencies out. 
I said, because this would be good to do. I don't mean to catch him out because I under and on art believe that they're telling me the truth. Mm -hmm. And he did. And we get, and he knew, they knew what the, he was doing and they told him he were a police officer. And, and I, I said at the end of the night, cause we'd had, don't forget we, when we go into these forests, Matt, we don't actually sleep. We, we have a fire round. We're sitting comfortable. Well, as comfortable as we can. We have a bit of food, maybe have a 40 winks, but we're there all night. I think Jimmy actually got into an hammock, but rest of us don't. And I said, I said to this police officer, friend of mine, I says, well, what do you think now after hearing that? And he went, well, I'll tell you now. He said, like I've told you before, Paul, and this guy's had his own experience, which I'll tell you about in a moment, but not cryptid related. He said, for me, seeing is believing. And I cannot, it'll make sense this might in a moment, but yeah, you're right. He said, I can't believe this unless I see it with my own eyes. Thank he says, you, well, yeah. He says, but I'll tell you what, I believe they're telling me the truth. So, you know, so that kind of is, is being as honest as he can be. I need to see this with my own eyes before I can believe something such a, a, an horrendous, hideous thing could exist. But are they got, and then get, get my teeth back in, Paul. Are those guys telling the truth? Yeah, I believe they're telling me the truth. Fabulous account. So any thoughts on any of that? Matt, you know? Yes, you know what? I, I'm so glad that you brought that up because, you know, you guys interviewed a, a good friend of mine, uh, Dominic Josh Nanocchio, yeah. who is an amazing human being, just an incredible talent, but in even better, just soul. He's just such a good person, a good father, a good man, uh, so humble. I mean, look at the guy. He's got 700,000 subscribers. You would think he That's has one. Brilliant. Yeah, and he, you'd think he has one, the way he acts. And he's really like that. He's just a good man. He was on, um, he was on uh, uh, the the Doug Haysack show, uh, the the um, Untold Network, the other day, and and he actually brought me up. And he said they were asking him about, you know, his opinion on experiences that he's heard before. And he said, you know, the one I've been most affected by was Matt Amsh. And he said, if you look on paper, if it was writ written out on an email like you had said he's like you know a lot of people might say you know i don't believe this i don't like it but when you see the individual physically affected when when you look in their eyes and you see the fear and, and the reactions physically he said that that changes it and i i'm very proud of the fact that i have had you know especially on his his interview with me you know we're, we're talking upwards of seven hundred thousand people have seen it and i've had professional behavioral PhDs, psychologists, psychiatrists, ex-police officers, federal agents, uh, Adam Davies, who I'm sure you're very familiar with, is very popular, a great guy, um, a good friend. And, and he used to be a court cross-examiner, a professional one. And they've all said the same thing. And Matt shows no signs of lying. When you see it in their face and you hear them, and, and, you know, there's a lot more detail to what, how they yeah. come about their opinion. So I, I agree with you. When you see somebody, you know, give their recount of what's happened to them and how they're physically affected by it. You, you can't fake those things. So I 100% I, I agree with you. And, you know, I was just now, as I said, I'm wiping sweat from my face and I, I know where they've been and, that that's that's really disturbing and and i believe he was also being watched by something else when he was watching the other one so they knew he was there it's, it's strange how these things can put a feeling onto someone uh you know their influence but don't you think matt that the 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 thread or certain parts of the unexplained, the, the intelligence that is the unexplained phenomena, let's just separate it from the, the, the cryptid for a moment. Certain parts of that exotic science that's been employed are running through all parts of the unexplained phenomena. And mm -hmm. there's common attributes that are running through them all. This, the, the lower silence, that's what I, the, the term that I've coined it. People say the Oz factor, but the lower silence, a UFO sighting, People talk about everything going quiet, everything, can't hear the insects, can't hear traffic anymore. Uh, you know, that the, 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 during the UFO sighting, during the alien type experience, during the cryptid type experience, it's the same science that's been employed to create that effect. I'm not saying that it's a godhead. I'm not saying that it's one 
intelligence. For all I'm saying, no, though, it might be, but I'm not saying that's what it is. But I do think that it's the same type of, or the same mechanics that are being employed to work through it all. The snap of a branch, Matt Emch is in a forest with a group of people, hypothetically. You're in the forest. Everything feels a bit strange. You hear a branch snap. You focus on the branch, your colleagues focus on the branch, but the magic's taking place with the other hand. And then you suddenly realise you've been enveloped in this, this strange lower silence. And, it, and it's this science, and, and I'm not saying this as an expert, I'm saying just what I think, and I, I, I don't mind if people correct me or have another idea, but this science, even though it targets the individual, me, Les, you, your friends, it, it appears to me that it can't just target you. It has to target the land. Otherwise, the insects would not be going quiet. The birds would not be stopping singing. Or we could look at it another way. Are we actually, and I don't mean you didn't see and experience the creature, or I don't mean I didn't see and experience the, well, oh, get your hands right, Paul, that one. Uh, these, these beings during childhood. But in some instances, are we actually seeing these things or how if this if this intelligence that is the unexplained phenomena can place visuals in our minds can speak to us in our minds some of the time could could these experience experiences actually being be, be being placed into our mind and we're experiencing them you know you know there's all all them things i mean i, I don't think in your case and i really listened intently to your account that that's the case i think you saw what you saw and it was there that was physical in the on the day mm -hmm. uh you know I, I i really do and i think that jimmy and steve saw what they saw but I, i'm just wondering in some instances what it, it, part of that sighting part of that experience at broxa whatever it was was able to influence one of those witnesses long before it made its presence known it it made its presence known to him but not mm. the others it, it, it's fascinating and you know the more we look into it matt the more we should kind of jump down this dark rabbit hole of strangeness and go off into all these different branches the less we know or less i know you know i, I, I form one theory and and uh, uh, kind of opinions and then something else occurs and I, I, it changes you know it's 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 strange uh, and you may be the same, you may not. And we can jump to a UFO type sighting and I'm going to go, but we've spent time on the cliff tops many nights when he comes to the area. He lives, up, he lives up country in the UK and travels down. And originally he'd been listening to me talking on a podcast, some Howard Hughes, The Unexplained or something. And he didn't think it were a load of rubbish, but he thought that a lot of what I'd been talking about, good God, there seems to be a lot going off here. I'm not quite sure that any of this it might be a little bit hyped up. And he drove down from up north, parked his car up, didn't tell me, he didn't tell me we're coming down. I didn't know him at this point, parked up at what's called Bempton. So anybody, any of your listeners can Google these places at the RSPB car park. From there, he walked on foot in the night along the cliff tops. The cliffs here, Matt, range from 200 foot sheer rock face, not, not, and the, nobody climbs them, the sheer, to 420 foot at the heist at Speeton. He walks to Speeton in the dark. Brave guy. If anybody's ever watched the Vikings and Ragnar out of the Vikings, he looks like him. Anyway, not that that matters. Uh, he gets to Speeton along this lonely cliff top path just armed with a weak torch and a phone. There's a point there, there's a highest point, a stone-like marker there, a trig point, and he stood looking at it. He's got his torch on it looking. He says, and I turned round and looked down the path. Bearing in mind, Matt, you've got the North Sea to the left, nothing but sea and cliffs and farmland to the right, no properties, no street lights, nothing. He said, and on the path, about 18 inch above, I can see a crimson to deep red light big ball of light that looks like it's got a belt on the in the middle. So that's why I called it the speed and figure of eight. He said, it looks like it's pulled tight with a darker band. He said, I'm looking at it. He said, I can't work it out. He says, I'm, I'm staring and I'm fumbling for my phone because I want to see if I can get a picture of it. He says, and it's just there. It's just there hovering. And it's 
it looks to be about, I don't know, 30, 40 yards in front of me. He said, so in end, I just looked down for my phone. And when I looked back, it had gone. He said, but it'd been replaced by three of the most brilliant LED white lights that I'd ever seen. He said, so bright that it were hard to look at them. But interestingly, they weren't illuminating anything. So that, that is, there's weirdness it's at light, isn't it, really? He said, so there's two and there's the third one's slightly higher. So not quite a perfect pyramid, but the third one's slightly higher. Now reaches for his phone. As he reaches for his phone, they disappear. He said, so I set off running. He was a fit guy. And he said, and I wanted to, he's not looking for unexplained. He'd gone down there thinking, I think what this guy's talking about. He didn't think it was rubbish, but he wanted to see for himself because he thought there was too much of it. There isn't too much of it, Matt. The reason it's so prolific is because I'm at this 24-7 and people think it's happening every night. There's years in between, but I've got hundreds of accounts from lots of people over decades. And that's why it looks like it's a rich, you know, it's a rich area. He said, so I set off running along this narrow cliff top path. I wanted to catch somebody on a quad bike. I wanted to catch, I don't know, army cadets out and some kind of strange light, anything. And he ran, <coughs> excuse me, he ran all the way back to the RAF base, disused RAF base. Uh, there's a big fence around it and it's been disused since 1968. So that we know there's nothing there. Right. Said, Absolutely nothing. He went back to the car park. Uh, I don't know. Well, I'm not going to say a month later, but sometime later he contacted me and shared the experience. Since then, we've met up lots of times in the, it tells me he's coming down. And I think somebody's going to make all that effort to drive all that distance and spend some night, a night up there. I go and spent night up there with him and, uh, We've not had an experience. I've got to admit, there's nothing happened. Uh, but that's the nature of unexplained phenomena, Matt. I mean, mm -hmm. I hope you never see what you saw again. Yeah, and the too. chances are you won't. But, but uh, you know, it doesn't perform to order. That's what I'm saying. So we could probably go out there a thousand times and, and see nothing. It's usually that, that moment when you're least expecting it that it smacks you straight between the eyes. It's there, mm -hmm. you know. Any views on that, Matt? You know, I, I do. Um, you know, I, I've had a couple other things happen to me. In fact, this past spring, uh, you know, I, and I, I was in Beaver Creek State Park in Ohio, and I had something else uh, of a high strangeness happen to me. I even caught an EVP uh, of something on there that, uh, you know, it's pretty incredible. And, you know, I, it's just these things, as you just said, it was perfectly put. And when you least expect it, that's when they, they come up and they smack you, so to speak, and they let you know that there's things going on. And, uh, you know, some people, for some reason, just have a, a, a more of a sensitivity to, to seeing these types of things. You always hear about uh, frequencies and things like that. You know, everything on planet Earth has a frequency, rocks, plants you know, creatures, uh, animals, humans, and, and so do these things of high strangeness. And once in a while, we will match each other's frequencies and we'll see them, or they just decide, you know what, I'm going to, I'm, you know, this person for some reason is grabbing me. I'm going to grab them. I wanted to mention real fast, you had said how some of these beings, for whatever reason, might make themselves look a certain way to us. There was a, I'll, I'll touch on it real quick. There was a story, I'm sure you've heard of the Beast of Bray Road. I have, yeah, yeah. So, you know, another dog man, werewolf type creature, which is regularly seen in Wisconsin. Um, there was a girl, I forget her name. She had went to a summer camp around that area, uh, witnessed a, a dog man across the way one night. And she watched it for a while. The next night she went out by herself, which I didn't think was very smart <laughs> to the same area. And she was looking for it. And she came upon a, a, a big ball of red light in the same exact area. She had witnessed this beast of Bray road and it was moving almost. She said with intent, and she stepped on a branch, snapped the branch, and she said it stopped and turned to face her. And it makes you think, and then it went away, it, 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 she couldn't follow it anymore, it just kind of dissipated. And it makes you think, is that 
what its real form is and then it's yeah. able to make us see that so that we don't go after it it puts the fear of god in us by seeing something else so just another level of you know what what are what are we seeing what is going on here uh, do you know Matt, i think it's great that you, that you obviously you're you're not it's not open mindedness we we touched on that before you don't have to believe you've had the no. experience but i think it's great that you you're, you're open enough, and myself, I, I know I am, to, to, to try and, not to try and mix, but not to omit the red ball of light from the cryptid sighting. Right. If it, it's happened, we must include it, not unlike some researchers, not just in the US, but in the UK as well, that are looking for something that's, that's some unidentified ape or, or, or creature that's just gone at, under the radar should we say because you know 2019 november and I'm, we're limited for time here matt mm -hmm. oh just one more thing matt because it's it's obvious that you've got so much more to share besides the the the, the your own dogman encounter uh, yes. or experience we'd love you to come onto the truth proof channel again at, at some point Thank soon be yeah that would, be, that would be brilliant thank you so br briefly then uh 2019 uh, November the 14th 2019 I went up to the cliff tops these cliffs with a guy called Lee Hayward who's in Wolflands and he, Lee very is, is really articulate really switched on kind of guy he wanted to try and find an explanation for the spheres of light that we document and we've been filming on the cliffs and out at sea in a good way he's not some kind of snide criticizing guy he's just we got up there it makes you wonder certain people attract it or certain people get chance to see these things we saw the lights and over a period and i'm condensing this story over a period of two or three hours that night these lights presented in various uh, places over the sea i turned round to speak to lee because i'm as fast as you take trying to film them they're switching off they switch on they, they come into existence and and then just go they're not flying from anywhere but i turned and in the field there's a huge sphere of light it's absolutely huge in lee's Lee's analogy was that the, the the light that was coming off it, it was the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. That's what that, and you know, and as I'm swinging this Sony camera around to try and film it, it's just dissipating and it's gone. Never seen anything like that up there before. However, during COVID, so this is 2019 that we saw the light. During mm -hmm. COVID, myself and an old chap who comes up with us, Bob Brown, I contacted a farmer that I knew and he let us go on his land which went over to the cliffs, but tucked out of the way so we're not bothering nobody and just observed the sky. A guy walked up. So this, we're going back uh, forward a few years now with his dog, asked us what we were doing, said we were just bird watching. We didn't want to get into it because it's not, if, it's not something you can just spring on somebody, is it? You know, you know we're looking for UFOs. Mm -hmm. It disappeared, this guy. 45 minutes later, he's come back. It's now dark. He knows we're not looking for, for seabirds, the seabird colony up there. That's basically what a lot of people go for. And we told him that we were looking for these lights. I'm trying to condense this. And he's, he said he'd lived in the area for the past, I don't know, 15, 20 years. And he'd never seen any lights over the sea or anything. He'd got windows that looked over the sea. Fine, that's all good. Just as he's leaving, Bob, who was with me, said, have you seen any unusual animals? And he said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, there's a big black cat being seen on the cliff tops, And, you know, they're not native to the UK. So we usually feel that's a good way to broach a conversation and see how open someone is. Because we, I think everybody in the UK now accepts that the big, the, the big cats, the pumas and things are at large in remote areas. Mm -hmm. He said he'd not seen them. Bearing in mind, we saw the sphere of light on November 19 on the 14th. He said, but seeing as I've got you guys asking me things of an unexplained nature, he says, I am going to tell you something. He says, I haven't even told my wife. And he'd got a dog with him. It was a pointer dog, a gun dog. He told his dog to sit down. And he said, this dog's very clever. He says, and back in 2019, I dropped onto the beach at a place called Reeton. Uh, bearing in mind, we were very close when myself and Lee Hayward to the other, the next little seaside area called Speeton. So there's a difference between the names. He said, and I walked along the beach and he said it was a full moon and everything's sort of bright. He said, and the dog's very clever. He said, and he stands in a different stance if he sees a rabbit 
to how he would stand if he sees a pheasant. He says, I can kind of read him. He said, I can't work out what's the matter with him. He's, he's really, he's looking awkward and I don't know what's the matter with him. He says, and he's looking at something up on the hill. And now the cliffs at Spaten are about 45 degrees, but they go vertical. But he's on the 45 degree plane looking up. Gets his binoculars, looks up and he sees an animal that he believes looks like a donkey or a small pony or even a large goat on on the on the the 45 degree cliff side mm -hmm. and he's looking at this thing he said and then it stood up on two legs mm. he said and it's just looking and he says i can't see eyes i can see a muzzle i can see ears he said it's thin he said it looked like the werewolf from harry potter that's what he said he said and it's looking at us and the, obviously that he's got his dog at this side and i said did you is it, 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 he said i weren't frightened so it's a, quite a distance away he said, and it turned and ran and went on two feet over the top of the cliffs. It kind of matches up with what the military guys said, with what the military guys saw on February the 7th, 2019. But jumping to the date, I looked then after he told me it was the full moon in November, and the full moon in November was the 12th. We were literally a mile and a half away from where me and Lee Haywood saw the sphere of light on the 14th. Is there a correlation? Is there a link here? We know we can't say for definite, but I think potentially there is. I think the light form phenomena and the cryptid do have some kind of uh, relationship. There's something there. I don't know what it is, but there's something there. Well, you know, I, I, I just wanted to, again, you know, touch on obviously, you know, night people is something really big for you right now. Is there anything? I know there's so much to to what has happened is there anything that that you could tell us a little bit more about that yeah well yeah i mean literally obviously there's a the, these are the cameos of events i don't have a i don't have a situation that starts at the beginning a middle and an end i've got mm. memories from childhood and you know I've, I've no fear in saying this matt i mean i wouldn't have said it years ago 61 years old now i wet the bed but until I was 14 years old, because I dare not leave the bedroom at night, even though what were happening were happening in the bedroom. You know, it, it, it was absolutely horrendous. And my dad, he, I'm not, you know, he's not here now. So, I, you know, I'm not, I don't want to sort of bad mouth people. After all, he was my dad. But it, let's just say he was a guy that would settle any argument or anything with them he would hit mm. first and ask questions later and mm. i were the one that suffered at his hands i weren't telling him any of this were was right. happening you know mm. and I, I remember one of the first instances and it's this it, you're kind of rabbit in headlights we had cattle at the back of our home in the field freezing mm. cows i'd look at them with the big black eyes you know my dad would tip his long clippings over and they'd come to fence and they'd look at us so where am i going with this my, the back bedroom my back bedroom three bedroom council house i'm in the bedroom gray silver gray curtains made of fiberglass unbelievably so if people can so shows you how far back we're going i'm laid in bed first this is my first memory that's what night people opens up with really and i wake up in the night and i'm looking at eyes in curtains and i'm only like I don't know. I, we don't keep a diary. So let's I'm either four, five or six. That's all I can say. And I'm looking at them and I'm not frightened. And I'm looking and the sort of coming in and out of focus. And I'm I'm looking at these eyes in my bed and I'm laid in bed in my bedroom. And they look like cow's eyes. That's as a child. We only have what we can draw upon from life, mm -hmm. life experiences. And they look like the eyes of cows. And then they come out of the curtains and they're what for one in all intents and purposes, they what an alien depicted what a grey alien would look like. And they're round the bed. And I'm terrified. And I can't understand it because they can't be round bed because they're at either side of bed and my bed's against wall. I don't, do you, know, do you know, it's just so many things that don't make sense. Right. But they're there and I'm screaming and I'm not making a sound. And, and, and I know I'm screaming and I'm not making a sound. And the next thing, it's morning. I've wet the bed. I, I get up. First thing I receive is a what my dad would call a good hiding for wetting the bed. You know, I, I get smacked for wetting the bed. And then it continued and it didn't continue every night. It probably didn't continue every month or even every, every second month. But throughout your life from, say, four to 14 years old, if you've got a collection of four or five of them a year, 
these cameos of events it's traumatic going to bed at night was never ever the same again when i used to wake up in the morning and it were almost like i were a different person i was a different boy i, I didn't think even think about it i didn't want to it well like i just shut the door on something horrendous and then when it got to about half past five six o'clock it was time to go to bed i was absolutely terrified Absolutely, I was watching for them every night. Every night of my life, I'm looking for them. If I could have crawled into a wall, I'd have got into a wall. I was so frightened. I'd bunch all covers up into a ball and leave a little gap to look for these things coming. Never mm. ready when they came. Never ready. There could have been months in between each one of those visitations. I'm not here to convince people, Matt, but it's just a horrendous experience. And anybody that's gone through it, you know, we all have our own experiences i suppose and we, we we all deal with the best we can and i'd love to talk to you more about that at some point matt yes of course i would too and and you know of course we're coming up on on the end here um you know i just wanted to thank you very much for for being here it's been an honor you know getting to know both you and Les and working with you and um you know everyone definitely check out truth proof on youtube subscribe hit that notification bell like it watch everything remember everybody it's really important on youtube to watch these videos the full length through it helps these t these channels you will not be disappointed with their show yeah the, the truth proof book the truth proof books can be obtained through the website truthproof.uk the kindle version of all these books uh, is obviously available on Amazon. Uh, we, obviously, we've got the DVDs for anybody who wants a solid copy of Wolflands, but it's also available to download on Amazon Prime. It's and amazing. Do you know, Matt, I suggest to people, even if you're not interested in buying a book or a DVD, and so I'm not the best salesman in the world, read the reviews. That might convince you to have a go at buying them because Agreed. original research, without a doubt, I don't think there's a film out there like like Wolflands, mm -hmm. you know, and we've got Martin Groves who actually raved about Wolflands and what, such as yourself as well, people who've been there front line and had these kinds of experiences, you know that the guys in here are telling the truth, they're speaking. I do. That's why it resonates so much with me. And just like my good friend, Martin, who him and I are very good friends. I absolutely, you know, I don't blow smoke for any reason. It's no good to lie about something. It doesn't help anyone if it's not true. Everybody, I am telling you, Wolflands is absolutely top-notch, phenomenal. And I was on edge, of course, with what happened to me. Uh, Paul, it, it has been an absolute pleasure, as always. Everyone, please, uh, on Planet 412, like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. Uh, it's always an honor to have any new... Uh, I call them 412lings out there and uh, check out Paul. He is absolutely top notch. Cream of the crop, everybody. Sir, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night.